Oh, oh, I forgot to show one thing. I, I don't know if I have time to show it. Um, guess not. Uh, you can do some things with the math, uh, some fun things with the Mathematica. And since you all have access to Mathematica, let me just encourage you to try this on your own. So this is what I have. Uh, what I have written here is the differential equation, right? Minus h bar squared over 2m, double position derivative psi x, 1 half mass omega squared x squared psi x is equal to energy psi x. Okay? And I'm plugging that into equation 1. And uh, my eventual goal is to plot it out. So let me just set all these constants to 1. Um, I'm essentially choosing a unit system where h bar is equal to 1, mass of my particle is equal to 1, and the natural oscillation frequency is equal to 1. It's uh, what they call natural unit. <laughs> so, OK, so let me do that. So with that unit system, this equation becomes this form. It has only one undetermined parameter, energy. So you kind of have to plug in the values of energy. Let me show you that uh, mathematically, that energy of zero is not a possible result with this. Let me try to plug in zero energy. I want zero energy for my solution. Mathematica somehow still comes up with a solution. Maybe you, don't, you have no idea what parabolic cylinder D is. <laughs> I have no idea either. Mathematica has a lot of special functions. Most of them are solutions to differential equations. <laughs> so what I would do instead is I would plot it out. That's what I'm doing here. That's what all these commands are doing. I'm just plugging in some parameters, either 1 or 0 for this first and second integration constants. So I do it two different ways where I plug in 1, 0, and then 0, 1. So um, wait, no more originally was an absolute value. So when you plot them, this is what you get. Um, this is the first result. Second one doesn't give me anything. That's probably because whatever this was, this is giving me a complex value. So if you wanted to plot something, anything at all, then you can force it to say, all right, give me absolute value. Oops. Give me absolute value then um, this is what I get. Something that blows up to infinity as you go far away, and, or something that blows up to infinity whichever direction you go far away in. And this is what tells you, all right, so, um, so neither of these two independent solutions can give me a real physical solution where a particle is confined within that harmonic well. That this is what tells me energy equal to zero is not possible. All right, so let me plug in energy equals h bar over two. So that would be one half in our unit system. Then uh, this is the solution I get. It's, I still have two independent solutions. Let me plot them both out. Um, then this is, this is the uh, solution that you saw plotted in the textbook. This is the ground state solution. And whatever this is, OK, we are going to throw this one away because it's giving me something unphysical. Um, OK, let me try. OK, so I agree that energy equal to 0 is not possible. What if I'm a little bit insistent that h bar omega should also be a possible energy? Like, why not? Well, this is why not. You get some answer. And when you plot them out, none of them are physically possible solutions because they all blow up at infinity. It's not representing a particle that's confined in that harmonic potential. All right, so you then give up and go with the actually values that are given as a lot of values in your textbook. Then, um, so not all solutions will be physically uh, realistic. Like this one is physically unrealistic, but this one is. This is the one solution, the first uh, excited state solution with one node. And let me do the next to two more energy levels. So right, so four is not going to work. It has to be five. Then now hopefully I have a yeah, solution with the two nodes. And if I do it, all right, one more, seven. Six is not going to work. And I do seven. Then the one of the two solutions I get, I have one, two, three nodes. Yeah. So that's it. Um, you can kind of, um, if you want to try it out, you can do it on your own. It's fairly simple. Uh, quote. Um, um, oh, there's one more thing I really need to mention. Um, 
This is what your book claims is um, uh, an example of correspondence principle. Do you guys remember what correspondence principle is? Uh, someone other than Gauger. What does the correspondence principle say? This is a principle that's important in modern physics, both the special relativity and quantum mechanics. No one here remembers correspondence principle? I briefly mentioned it when we were talking about special relativity. It comes down to this, um, Newtonian mechanics, is it wrong? Is it, okay, um, is it wrong like um, alchemy was? Is it wrong like astrology is? Is it still right in some sense, right? It is experimentally tested. It is a good approximation. So, so all right, so we found better theories, special relativity and quantum mechanics. That doesn't mean classical mechanics you learned, it doesn't mean you have to throw them out. It just means you now recognize those are approximations. So this is what correspondence principle says. Special relativity and quantum mechanics, these are more exact theories of nature. But when you take them to the limit where the approximations should be correct, that these more precise theories, special relativity and quantum mechanics, agrees with the approximations of classical mechanics. So in the special relativity, when you took the energy for kinetic energy and took the low speed limit, you, we recovered one half mv squared. So in quantum mechanics, the results are a little bit, um, not always easy to interpret. That's why I'm putting on this screen and I mean to ask you. Um, so I hope it's clear what it's plotting here. It's plotting absolute value squared of the wave function. So the probability density of the wave function over the space um, of, wait, it's not showing me the, uh, uh, wait, I thought it was showing me, um, well, it's not quite, all right, let me, let me do my own version. I don't like the version that's in the textbook. Um, so 12, uh, so this should be uh, 13. Wait, what? Um, no, sorry, that's not 13. Um, it should be 25. What? Oh, oh, I, I know why. Because I'm not going from small and large enough value. All right, maybe a little bit. Let's actually go farther than what your book does. Um, 45, so that should be n equals 22 state. Um, okay, I, I think I'm gonna stop showing the result because it's kind of getting in the way. Uh, and let me stop plotting the second one because that's never giving me what I want. Um, let me go from range of minus 20 to 20. And finally, I'm going to uh, print, um, I guess that's uh, good enough. Uh, let me go from minus 10 to 10. Um, and I guess the quickest way to do it is this, because um, the scale won't be exactly the same. Uh, let me actually do, sorry, one last thing. Uh, I, I, won't, I want um, absolute uh, squared of all of this. So that should give me the probability density when it's done drawing. And 
and this probability density is, um, let's see if I can make it bigger. So the um, kind of, it's on a different scale, that's why I'm drawing this one by hand. Um, this is the potential energy, kinda, more or less. The, this is the, close enough. Um, so this is the potential energy, one half m omega naught squared, x squared, and um, the way it kind of matches up around here, around here, this should be the energy level. Um, this should be the, this is my E22. Yeah. So this is the question. How does this, um, um, how does this agree with your classical intuition about, beha about a behavior you expect to see in a classical oscillator. Like what feature do you see here that's uh, noticeable? You are looking at this shape, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of concave up. Um, and since this is probability density, what that means most of that, like the highest probability of particle being found is up here or here. So let me translate that into classical version of uh, what the similar statement would be. It would be saying that, all right, so I have this oscillator. Um, this is my x equals zero position. And imagine I've displaced it and then let it move up and down. And I guess what it's saying is somehow if uh, at some random moment in time I measure position of this mass, it's somehow saying that it's more likely to be found towards the end point than towards the equilibrium position. Is that the case? Classically? That this mass is more likely, at just a random moment in time, it's more, let, let's try to do it this way. Um, Let's do a quick experiment. Um, so, all right, let, let me divide my world into three regions. So regions one, two, three. Yeah. I'm just going to say, um, as some, I'm gonna turn around and I'm just gonna, without looking, I'm just gonna say at some moment the phrase, uh, I guess now, and at that moment, just uh, I'm gonna say that about, I want to be statistically correct. Let me say that 20 times. Uh, one of you keep the number of times it's found in regions one or three, or sorry, um, somebody keep a number of times it's in region one. Who wants to do that? Okay, and who wants to keep a number of times it's in region two? Kaoje, who? Okay, uh, Zenkai will do region three. So, all right, so I'm gonna, let me start it off and then I'm going to turn around and I'll just say it now whenever I feel like saying it. Ready, set, go. Now. 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 I can't be rhythmic. Now. Now. Now, I think I'm waiting the same amount of time, right? So I have to break up the rhythm somehow, it's hard. Uh, now. Now. Now, next two are gonna come quickly. Now, now. 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 Now, now, okay, uh, I guess I have five more, I'll do five more. Now, 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 now. <laughs> yeah, I got bored. Okay, um, <laughs> Kevin, could you give me your count? 10, 
10 times. Gao Jie, your number. All right, all right. I, so we can figure it out. Tenkai, do you have your cow? About five. All right, so it should be five. So, because I did it 20 times. Yeah. So, um, all right, so it's a, um, with the small numbers, you don't quite see it. But a pattern that's a beginning to emerge is that this mass is more likely to be found near the ends than in the center. Because, um, like, if they were all equal probability, then it should have been, you know, like a seven, 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 or something close to that. Or if it's more likely to be found in the center, then maybe this should have been 10. Uh, but it's not the case. It's that it's actually uh, more frequently occurring near the edge. Why do you think that is? Like, now that you see kind of a, that maybe being the re result, like, can you come up with a reason why that should be the case? Yeah, you look at the velocity. So it spends more time in this range and here than the amount of time it spends here. So, and that's what this quantum mechanical result is showing too. Even though this says, you know, this doesn't explicitly deal with the velocity, the probability of the particle being found near the classical turning point is greater than the probability of being found where the kinetic energy is largest. So this is an illustration of correspondence principle that way. And your textbook does you know, spend more time talking about it, so you can read through it. Uh, and this dotted line it's showing is actually the classical probability. Uh, that's why it goes to southern, anyways. Um, so um, yeah, I guess that's all we have time for with the harmonic oscillator.